Hello, I'm Julia Knights, Deputy Director at the Science Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in our series of our Global Climate Talks in the run-up to the most important international climate conference this year, the COP26. Climate change is arguably the most important issue of our time and our response to it will define not only our generation, but generations to come. If we together rise to this global challenge, it could represent perhaps humankind's greatest achievement ever. This series brings together global leaders in science, policy, business and innovation, along with artists, authors, campaigners and other thinkers to explore the impacts that climate change is already having on our ecosystems, our biodiversity and on humankind, and also crucially to debate the solutions to tackling climate change on a global scale towards limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which we know, according to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 1.5 Special Report, will require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes across energy, land, industrial, urban and other systems, as well as across technologies and geographies. This series of events will take place at our five museums across the Science Museum Group in Bradford, York, County Durham, Manchester and London. My deepest thanks to the speakers and indeed to all of you for taking part in this debate. And now I'd like to give the floor to your chair for this evening, the brilliant mathematician, author and broadcaster, Dr Hannah Fry. Hannah. Well, thank you very much, Julia, and hello to all of you. I'm Hannah Fry, and I am delighted to be chairing the very first of the Science Museum Group's Global Climate Talks series. Now, the past 12 months have been one of the most challenging periods any of us have ever experienced. But like many people, I think that we face a far bigger and far more enduring threat. And tonight we're going to be asking the most basic question of all. Why should we care about climate change? We're going to be discussing the science, the impacts of climate change on our biodiversity, our ecosystems, our economies, and on the survival of all of us, our children and future generations to come. And we're going to be asking what we can all do to tackle climate change. Because what we do know is that this global issue needs everyone on board. That's consumers, governments, industry leaders, energy companies, and civil society. So tonight I'm going to be having a chat with each of our individual guest speakers and we will then move on to an open, open panel discussion and then we're going to be taking um, some of your questions. So thank you to everyone who has been sending in questions already for our panel. We've had some really excellent uh, questions and I think we'll have a very interesting discussion later on. Um, but then finally, I will be asking the panel for their thoughts on what all of us can do right now to help to tackle climate change, uh, including, of course, the power that we have as voters in holding our leaders to account and our buying power as consumers. But now, in no particular order, let's meet tonight's amazing panel. Uh, first, let's welcome Dr. Jane Goodall, the founder of the Jane Goodall Institutes and a UN messenger of peace, an ethologist and conservationist known for her groundbreaking research into the lives of wild chimpanzee in, Gom in Gombe, Tanzania, which is now in its 60th year. She is also the subject of the brilliant Emmy Award winning documentary, Jane. Good evening, Jane. Next, a warm welcome to Wanjohe Jureji, joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Wanjohe is a climate activist, a forest restoration ad advocate, an entrepreneur, and uh, the founder of People Planet Africa. Welcome, Wanjohe. Uh, we also have Kira Peter Hansen, who is joining us from Denmark this evening. Now, Kira is a member of the Greens European Free Alliance, uh, and she is the youngest ever member of European Parliament. Welcome, Kira. Very good to have you. Um, and last but by no means least, we are also joined by Dr. Tamsin Edwards, who is a climate scientist at King's College London and a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Sixth Assessment Report. Good evening, Tamsin. Uh, and actually, Tamsin, I think that we're going to 
open tonight's discussion with you because I really wanted to start off this evening by talking about the science and, and maybe even the basics. So if we start at the very beginning here then, how do we know, Tamsin, that the planet is getting hotter and why are climate scientists so certain that, that it's due to human activity? Good evening, Hannah. Um, it's a whole array of evidence. So we have a network of weather stations, of measurements from ships all around the planet going back at least to 1850 where we can reconstruct that we've seen um, an average of one degree of warming in the global average temperature. So that doesn't sound like too much, uh, but we'll, we'll get on to sort of why one degree matters, I think, uh, in a bit. And so the kinds of directions that we're going to go in this century are, are still measured in degrees. So we talk about one and a half degrees, two degrees, under very high emissions, it would be more like four or five, five and a half degrees of warming. And to sort of put that in context, the last ice age was about five or six degrees colder than the pre-industrial. So we're talking about going as far in one direction as we were from the last ice age. And and there's a whole array of evidence that that we use as scientists to understand our role in that warming past and present. And one goes back 160 years, John Tyndall's experiments of greenhouse gases, he showed that they absorbed infrared radiation, which is emitted from the Earth's surface, and re-radiated that around, warming up the surface and the atmosphere more than they would otherwise be. We've got satellite measurements that can measure the fact that that energy isn't going out to space anymore, that it's kind of trapped in our atmosphere. And we also use climate models to understand what fraction of the warming is down to us compared with other natural influences like changes in the sun um, or other changes. So, you know, we have a huge amount of evidence from sort of, you know, physical measurements, satellite measurements in the sky and, uh, and computer models as well, putting, putting it all together. Now, I mentioned in the introduction there that you are uh, a lead author on the IPCC's sixth assessment report. So just for people who aren't necessarily familiar with that, can you tell us what these reports are and why they are so important? Yeah, so the IPCC reports, um, the really big reports get put out about every seven years. And sometimes we have shorter special reports like the, the one and a half degree report we just heard about. And they're basically big summaries of the science written by scientists. Um, I must say we don't get paid for it. It's just in our spare time, evenings and weekends usually. And, and we're just trying to assess the, the evidence for policy makers, for decision makers, for the public, not only summarizing what we know, but how much confidence we have in different lines of evidence. You know, do, do all the studies agree? Are there, are there lots and lots of independent studies? Or is the evidence still quite early days, perhaps a bit weaker, we need to do some more research. So it's a really important um, thing to, th to think about the fact that we're, we're not only summarizing the evidence, we're also trying to assess the strength of the evidence and where we're most confident, where the predictions are the most likely. But finally, also, the report is not meant to be making um, uh, it's not meant to be making recommendations to governments. It's really laying out the options, it's saying if we do this, we think the climate change will be this much. And if we do that, we think the climate change will be this much and, and putting out that evidence basically for the policymakers to decide. And in terms of the evidence of what's happening uh, to the planet, I know that you've done a lot of work, particularly uh, around the climate change at, at the poles. Just how quickly are the ice sheets melting in the Antarctic and Greenland and, and, and what impact will that have on sea level rise? Well, both the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica are losing ice and, and contributing to sea level rise. and, and at, uh, at an increasing rate. So Greenland particularly sped up to about seven times the rate of, of ice loss um, in the last decade as it was just in the 1990s, Antarctica around four times. Now for Greenland, it's quite clear that the, the warming of the Arctic, the very strong warming in the Arctic is causing a lot of that melting. For Antarctica, probably the picture is a bit more complicated. It could be partly human influence and partly natural. But either way, there's there's this human influence, some natural as well, which is causing sea level rise now. And we expect to get probably faster this century, probably faster and faster and, and continue on beyond. And so some of the predictions, um, I guess the sort of minimum end of the predictions are sort of 30 centimetres or 50 centimetres of global average sea level rise. And the higher end are more like one and one metre, one and a half. Some, some predictions are much higher than that. 
And that, again, it doesn't sound like much. You know, we talk about one degree of warming or, or half a meter of sea level rise. But those are, when you apply that to the global average, the actual local changes can be really big. So Arctic mm. temperatures are warming three times faster. We've got three degrees of average warming. Um, I mentioned the last ice age kind of parallel. And with sea level rise, just half a meter or a meter of sea level rise will cause much, much more frequent flooding at the coast for the people that live along those coasts. So it's all about, it's one of the difficult things with climate science, I think, trying to sort of unpack these numbers which seem small when you look at the global average but locally to, to real people's lives they make huge differences it's interesting what you said there about things getting faster and faster sort of a, a feedback mm. effect you sometimes hear people talking about tipping points do you think that we are close as we are at the moment to a, to a dangerous tipping point I think that the idea of a tipping point is very powerful and it's it's really taken hold with a lot of people. And I think the answer is a, is a bit yes or yes and no here. So I don't think we uh, scientists think that we're approaching a threshold of, of runaway warming. And sometimes people think of the one and a half degree threshold as, as something where if we just go to 1.6 degrees, then we're going to end up with runaway accelerating warming. And, and that's not what scientists think will happen. There are uh, reasons to believe that warming could speed up when you get to higher levels. Um, there are there are feedback loops, there are amplifying processes like um, releasing more greenhouse gases uh, from the planet, basically, as, as the natural resources in the permafrost and so on, which could cause extra warming. But really, the scientists um, now think much more of what we call tipping elements. And that's parts of the planet that go, could go part past a point of no return. So the area that I, I worry about the most is the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, because that's a that's a, a part of, um, you know, it's it, it sort of, tr it's trapping three or, or four meters worth of sea level rise in, in the ice. And and we think that it's it's in a kind of an unstable state. And if we start to, to lose that ice, if we start to melt it at the edges because it's exposed to the ocean, it's actually touching the ocean at its bed then actually, even if we cooled the planet back down again, that, that ice loss might carry on and, uh, and be a tipping point in itself. So that it would be a tipping point for sea level rise rather than global warming. Still very serious, but not the same as, as runaway warming. So it's all about unpacking the different meanings of the word, the different um, uh, cases that it's, that it's applied to. Yeah. Lots to think about. Now, well, Tamsin, I think we're going to come back to you uh, a little bit later as part of our panel discussion. But now I wanted to chat briefly to our next speaker who's joining us from Kenya, uh, climate activist and founder of uh, People Planet Af Africa, which is a consultancy firm that works with rural communities and assists government agencies and helps businesses to become more sustainable. Good evening, Wenjohe Jiriji. Um, if we can start with that idea, actually, uh, Wanjohi, that the People Planet Africa, how how can you help organisations to be more environmentally sustainable? Thank you very much, Hannah, and greetings from Nairobi. Um, going green for businesses is a very new phenomenon here in Kenya. What is common and what most companies reach out to us for is corporate social responsibilities. But then you find that there's a company that is setting aside, uh, say, 100,000 US dollars to CSR, but then draining their chemical waste into uh, a lake that has uh, life underwater. Uh, so the, the two don't marry. It made us realize that CSR is not enough. Uh, we needed to encourage our clients to then become more sustainable to ensure that their practices are sustainable. Unfortunately for us, we do not have a law requiring businesses to go green. So those that are going green, it's either because of out of goodwill, uh, maybe they're international companies, or maybe they're targeting international markets that require them to, uh, to be sustainable. But then we still uh, show them that by going green, you're actually going to cut costs. For instance, the cost of electricity in Kenya is quite high. The electricity is also unreliable. So you tell them to uh, go for renewable energy as opposed to electricity. You tell them to install uh, sensor lights and have sensor taps. Um, that cuts on costs and reduces wastage as well. So they see sense in what you're saying, but it will take time. Um, and the missing part of the puzzle is how do we transition? So we, yes, we can put pressure. We still need to put pressure on the streets, but the how is missing and it's extremely important. And that is where we come in as people planning. 
Do you find that, are there, I guess, common mistakes that businesses tend to make? Are there, are there common ways that you find that businesses can, can do better? Certainly, yes. Um, you find that, um, first, allow me to speak to government. That governments in the global south are mostly focusing on collection of taxes as opposed to ensuring that the processes are environmentally friendly. Um, then when it comes to businesses, again, we are focusing more on profits uh, instead of focusing as well on their consumers and the, and the environment in which they operate in. And, and profits and, and taxes, for me, I have a problem. And I, I think we need to change the business model to focus more on people and planet. Because when the people are full, when people are whole, when the, the, the environment is whole, then it's easier and you tend to make more profits. So I think focusing on profit at the expense of people and planet is the biggest mistake that both governments and industry are making. And in terms of focusing on the planet, I know you've also uh, done a lot of work on the Save Our Forests campaign. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? What did you what did you set out to achieve and what did you achieve, I guess? Um, this was following the want on destruction of forests in Kenya. I tell you, it, it was a very, and still is a sorry state. Uh, so young people in my village came together. We were then fighting to save our small forests, but it slowly uh, but surely became a national conversation. We created a hashtag Save Our Forest KE uh, on social media and it became a platform for other people across the country to showcase the destruction of forests around them. Uh, within no time, we had attracted the attention of the old media and they invited us to do two documentaries which uh, forced government into action. It led to a total ban of forest harvest in Kenya. And we are currently reviewing the 2016 Forest Management Act, which has a lot of loopholes that have enabled uh, the current destruction of forests. Very impressive. Very impressive. It's good that you getting people behind you. It's not just forests, though, is it? I know that you've also done a lot of work um, advocating for the conservation of grasslands and wetlands too. Do you think that, that these are the type of projects that are the key to tackling climate change? Um, uh, Hannah, forests are extremely crucial when it comes to the hydrological uh, cycle. Uh, it affects uh, the transpiration, it affects evaporation, it also affects uh, the storage of water, which is extremely crucial when it comes to uh, the, the wetlands, which are our natural reservoirs. I worry that uh, people are not paying attention to water, but this might be the trigger of the next world war. And it's already happening if you look at the Darfur, uh, if you look at what is happening between Cairo and Addis Ababa over the Nile. Um, it is estimated that 1.8 billion people by 2025 will be out of water. And it's already happened in Cape Town uh, in 2018 when Cape Town, as South Africa, actually doesn't have water and relies on Lesotho for drinking water. And I worry that people are not paying enough attention to this and the relationship between water, grasslands and wetlands. Um, and that is why I, I, I struggle and I fight uh, to save our forests, wetlands and um, uh, grasslands as well. And we are embarking on a serious restoration project targeting forests that were wiped out in, in the 90s. And I think I'm at the point where we don't need to blame each other anymore. I think we need to come together and start working to save uh, particularly forests. And in terms of working together, I know that you also uh, curated the Nairobi hub of the Global Shapers community, which is uh, an, in an initiative of the, the World Economic Forum. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the, the Global Shapers community, as you rightly said, is an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Uh, it brings together young people in cities. And I was very privileged to lead the Nairobi Hub in 2018, 2019. Um, we come together and influence uh, society, influence change. We come together and address some of the issues that uh, society is dealing with. During my tenure, I was also able to bring together uh, youth from all over Africa and beyond to Nairobi. Uh, we were able to bring the leadership of our country. We had the deputy president in the room. We had industry. We had multinationals in the room as well to discuss the youth bulge and what we can do. How can we uh, make the best out of the growing youth bulge in, in Africa? I'm currently sitting on the foundation board that is a global board uh, for the global shapers community and i'm honored truly uh, to occupy this position 
but as well as those you know leadership and and, and higher up positions I, you mentioned a couple of times there um about you know getting young people involved and and ensuring that uh, i guess youth activism is alive why is it so important to you that uh, young people take up the, the fight against climate change particularly you know, the UN estimates that 1.2 billion people in the world are between the ages of 15 and 24. 2019, Kenya uh, had carried out a census that showed that 70% of the population is below 35. And uh, these are not just numbers. This for me is power. Power that can push governments, power that can push industry into action. Uh, 2019, last year, I was privileged enough to attend the Davos meeting and one of the leading beverage companies was just dumping things they're not going to face out their single-use plastics. And I thought to myself, imagine if this population boycotted these products for just a day. How powerful would that be? They would not even dare test them. They would change their ways. They would find better products because they can afford it. Um, but for us to do this, I believe we need to be A, empowered on how powerful we are. We need to be aware of the power that we possess. And number two, we need to be aware of the threat. I recently joined TikTok and I did a video that wasn't entertaining, but educational. And I couldn't believe that it has a hit of 150,000 uh, views. That means we can utilize these platforms to really educate the youth so that when they're going to vote and, and you know voting is another powerful thing uh over 70 percent of, of people who vote next year will be voting in kenya will be voting for the second time and over 45 percent will be voting for the first time this is a population for me that we must target if we want to uh achieve uh climate action you make a very persuasive argument. I am sure I speak for uh, everyone watching when I say that. Um, thank you very much, Majohi. We'll come back to you uh, later. Uh, if you have just joined us, we have heard from Dr. Tamsin Edwards and and also just then uh, Wanjohi Jureji, who we are going to return to both of those later. But now I wanted to talk to uh, climate activists and the youngest ever member of European Parliament, uh, who's joining us from Denmark, Kira Peter Hansen. Welcome, Kira. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, let's start off by talking about politics, if we may. Um, now, I know that a big part of your reason for getting into politics was to fight for, for a greener future. Do you think that political engagement is the key here to, to tackling climate change? I think it's one of the keys. Uh, I think political engagement is important because it forms, like the political and economic framework forms in so many ways what we can do. Uh, it decides how we, uh, cost uh, CO2 uh, and how much investments we have in, in the green transition. So I think it's really important to, to do political engagement, but I think we should also be aware that not everyone has the privilege to do political activism or to engage in the same way as others. Uh, so even the small changes are also important. Uh, and I think also, like now we see a lot of uh, young activists going out on the streets and that's really great. But I think it's problematic if we also just rely on the youth to deliver what previous generations haven't been able to deliver. Yeah, a very important point. And in fact, actually, I guess um, leads us on nicely from what uh, Wanjohi was saying there earlier. But do you think that the youth movement in Europe, uh, taking into account your point that you know you can't rely on it exclusively, exclusively but do, what impact do you think that that has had, that youth movement on EU leaders and their thinking about climate? I think it's had a, a tremendous impact. Uh, like going back to just 2016, 2017, uh, we were at a completely different stage when it came to discussing climate climate politics. Uh, and I, for me, it really showed when we in the parliament in uh, November 2019 declared climate emergency and used the words of Extinction Rebellion and climate activist. Uh, that for me really showed that Users not even not just like move the political discussion, but also the framing and the words we're using. Uh, and I think it is also pressured, uh, like not that progressive politicians and politicians from, from each party to have some kind of of climate issues uh, and climate agenda. Like you can't be a serious political party today if you don't have any working on uh, on climate. So I think it's done a great impact. In your time as an MEP then, do you think that the EU has done well on climate change or do you think that, uh, do, do they need to do better? What do they need to do better even on uh, in, in terms of tackling climate change? 
Yeah, because I think we've done much better than we've had before. And mm. definitely we have the Greenest Commission and the Greenest Parliament uh, today. Um, and we also see that now we are going to do a green deal with uh, reduction targets ranging from 55 to 60 percent, which isn't enough, but it's a it's a step. Uh, and I think this is also due to, to the big climate movements uh, that we've seen. Um, so we've done some progress, but I think it's still a lot in different sectors. Like we can do a lot on energy uh, and we've done that. But when it comes to agriculture, uh, we're still subsidizing uh, the meat industry really, really heavily uh, and not trying to get a more uh, diverse nature. Uh, so I think it depends on what kind of sector you're looking at. Uh, and of course, when we don't do the politics that are needed, uh, we don't succeed. Mm. Yes, quite true. Do you think, um, Kira, is there a danger of Brexit undoing that UK-EU collaboration uh, on climate change? Yeah, there's definitely a danger. Um, I think what we need to, to understand is that Brexit isn't finished now. So we have the agreement, uh, but we haven't seen the implementation yet. Uh, and what I see as a positive sign of this Brexit agreement, if you can talk about positive uh, signs in a Brexit agreement, uh, is that you have actually stated that you should live up to the Paris Agreement and UK can still be part of the uh, European trade emission system where we try to put prices on CO2, um, which is broader than what we do in, in normal trade agreements. So we've done some, and I think on, on climate, uh, we will be able to see that that the UK and the EU will work together. I think it'll be more difficult on uh, environmental issues, um, but I think it's it's still too early to say, and of course also something we should should be aware of, both from a parliament side and also from a UK side. I can see the other speakers backstage and everyone's nodding their heads as you're, <laughs> as you're speaking. Um, oh, within the EU though, I mean, of course, there is a, a, a range uh, of approaches. And I know that Denmark uh, recently canceled all new gas and oil exploration and plan uh, to phase out fossil fuels entirely by 2050. Would you urge other countries to, to follow that position? Is, is, is even that enough? Well, I hope that they will uh, end it uh, before 2050 uh, in the other countries as we think that would be a major step. Um, but of course, we need especially countries that have been just polluting for years uh, to take up some responsibility uh, because we have the capacity and the money for it, but you also have the historical uh, responsibility to do so. Uh, so I hope that, that other countries will follow uh, and I hope we can also try and do some agreements through the, the European Union so we can actually also commit countries not willing to to phase out to to do it soon and do you think that is enough well i guess it's not enough before you you end fossil fuel completely uh, like we we need to have a planet that's based on renewable energy uh, and we shouldn't uh, draw things up from the ground i think that's uh, obvious when we've uh, read the different climate reports yeah I know that you've also you've com you've campaigned uh, for a green economic transition. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I think for me it's important that first of all that we also in some way tax uh, pollution, uh, so that today we have a lot of pollution, but no one pays the price for it. Um, so having either a CO two taxation uh, would would work if we have a, a high enough uh, tax. I think that's the issue today that even though we have uh, quotas within the CO two system. Uh, the prices are still too low, so it's it's almost free to pollute. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the biggest uh, aspects we have to to do in relations to the economic uh, transition, and also in general to ensure that it's more profitable to invest in green transition and and green uh, 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 green products uh, than do what we've done until now. Have you seen positive impacts from your work already? Uh, yeah, I think so. Like, of course, I'm not the only one trying to do the change. And I think it's important to also uh, acknowledge that that doing climate activism and doing green transition is a teamwork. Uh, but I think some of the aspects that I'm quite proud of is that we, with this budget uh, for the, the Corona budget for the seven year uh, long budget, uh, we, for the first time, earmarked uh, money for biodiversity. Uh, I think that's a big step. Uh, it's not that much money, uh, but just having a European parliament stating that biodiversity is important uh, is a great step. 
Uh, and also, and that's on the more nerdy side, uh, but having a green taxonomy that tries to state what kind of investments are green and which are not, uh, to, to fuel some of the money into the, the green investments. I'm all about the nerdy side, Kira. I can join you on that one. Um, thank you very much, Kira. We are now going to go on to our next guest. We'll see you um, at the panel discussion in a moment. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by the pioneering chimpanzee expert and conservationist, uh, a woman who needs little introduction. Uh, it is Dr. Jane Goodall. Uh, good evening, Jane. Thank you for joining us. Now, I, I know that you've been studying chimpanzees in their natural environment for 60 years. Have you noticed any particularly striking environmental changes during that time, during those studies? Well, the answer to that is yes. When I first got to Gombe in 1960, that's Gombe National Park in what's now Tanzania, uh, it was part of this great forest belt that stretched right across from Western East Africa to the West Coast in the, across the equator, the equatorial lands. And uh, the chimpanzee range could be almost unbroken right across Africa. Mm. By 25 years later, when I flew over the tiny national park, it's only 35 square kilometers, smallest park in Tanzania, I was absolutely shocked. I knew there was deforestation. I wasn't prepared for what I saw. A tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills for miles. More people living there than the land could support. Overused farmland, infertile. People struggling to survive. And of course, because of this deforestation outside the park, the Gombe chimpanzees were absolutely isolated. When I first got there, there were about, um, there were three communities with about 150 chimpanzees. But on the north and the south, because Gombe lies along Lake Tanganyika, and in the north and the south, the two communities spent quite a bit of time outside the park. But then as the forest outside the park disappeared, the Gombe chimps had far less land, and there was some extreme intercommunity fighting. And by the time I flew over in 1990, there were only about 100 chimpanzees left. Big danger of inbreeding. And of course now, because we've worked with the local communities, because when people are very poor, they have to destroy the environment. Um, they got to grow food somehow or other, so that's why they were cutting all the trees down. Yes, there was terrible soil erosion, because there are many steep valleys, and they knew there would be soil erosion, but when you're having to feed your family, you're going to cut those trees down to get some land to grow food because your land is exhausted or to make charcoal to get some money. So because we've been working with these communities now since 1994, they have agreed to put land aside to make corridors, green corridors. So we have had some chimpanzee females come in bringing their genes with them, which is very important. But then, of course, all of this is indirectly tied to climate change, or maybe directly. And looking at the effect of climate change per se, we find that weather patterns have totally changed. There used to be two wet seasons, the short rains, and you could almost set the calendar. The short rains ended on Christmas Day. And then there were the long rains, which began towards the end of January and went on right the way until April. That doesn't happen anymore. There are no two clear cut seasons. There's no absolute, you can't be certain when it's going to be heavy rain and when it's going to be light rain. You may get no rain when it was used to be the rainy season. You may get rain in what used to be the dry season. And this has interrupted the fruiting seasons of different plants that are chimpanzee foods. And there have been times when chimpanzees recently have been really, really short of food. And so all of this can be tied up with, with climate change. I just want to go back for a moment to that, to what you were saying about those green corridors. 
how do you work with communities to to give them the means to i guess live sustainable lifestyles is it about education is it about economic empowerment how do you do that it's it's both actually and it was when i flew over this area and realized what had happened that i thought if if we can't help these people find ways of making a livelihood without destroying their environment we can't even try to save chimpanzees, their forests or anything else. So we began working with these local communities, first in the 12 villages around Gombe, in a program that we called Take Care or Tokari. And it was a very holistic program. And it included microcredit opportunities based on Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank, scholarships to keep girls in school, family planning information, and, you know, as you all know, it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And unless people are educated, they don't understand climate change. They can't possibly plan what to do, what decisions to make if they don't know why they're making them. And so it's really important to alleviate poverty because as I've said, when you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment in order to live because you have no option. And it's really important to have education so that people grow up knowing what decisions to make. Decisions about what you buy, which you cannot make if you're living in dire poverty. So poverty alleviation, education, uh, livelihoods that don't involve destroying the forest like tree nurseries and so on have made all the difference in the world it's not only corridors for the chimpanzees but if you fly over Gombe today you won't see bare hills the trees have come back there's been not only planting trees but leaving the land so that the seeds and roots in the ground have a chance to grow up again nature is resilient given her chance there's also the, uh, the the Roots and Shoots campaign, uh, which sort of calls to mind with what you're saying there and, and brings us back to uh, to what we were talking about earlier about uh, youth empowerment. I know that that's a, a campaign to just uh, empower children and young people to, to make a positive change in, re in relation to their environment. Do you agree with uh, what one Johi was saying earlier about how important young people are in, in, in our fight against climate change? Absolutely, I do. and young people you know i'm spending an awful lot of my time now working on this roots and shoots movement which began in tanzania with 12 high school students who were concerned about different problems some were worried about illegal dynamite fishing some are concerned about street children with no homes some are worried about uh, the poaching in the national parks why wasn't the government doing something about it and so these 12 students from eight schools came to talk to me about these problems. And I said, well, go and get your friends who also have concerns. We had a big meeting and this Roots and Shoots was born where we decided, first of all, the main message was every individual makes a difference every day, every individual has a role to play. And that because in the rainforest, I got to learn about the interconnection of all things and how every species has a role to play. We decided that each group of Roots and Shoots would choose three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help other animals, and one to help the environment. Because all of this is interrelated and it's no good tackling one problem unless you understand how that problem fits in the whole picture and the other problems which you have to solve at the same time. Yes, very uh, hard to disagree with you there, I think, Jane. Um, OK, what I think we'll do then, why don't we open this out to uh, the full panel? Um, now, in a moment, we are going to uh, get to the questions that the audience have sent in. Um, but, at the, but for now, I've got some more questions that I want to ask you. So I, I think I'm going to sort of throw these to specific speakers, but please do just uh, wave at me if, uh, if there's something you want to say or interject, interrupt me, that's all fine. Um, but let's start out with, I guess, 
uh, picking up there on what Jane was talking about, um, about the changes to the planet, I guess, that, that we can already see due to climate change. Uh, one day, I, I noticed you were nodding as Jane was talking. Do you want to pick up on that point? What changes uh, do you think are notable um, as we move forward in a, in a new era of climate change? Thank you, Hannah. Um, in Kenya currently, we are experiencing, there's a region called the Rift Valley, which is about 128,000 kilometers. It has uh, eight or so lakes, and they are experiencing crazy pricing, rising water levels. Um, early 90s, the government of the day passed a, a law uh, that allowed indigenous in quotes, indigenous communities into the forest. So you find um, in one of the biggest water catchment areas, it's called the Mau Forest, you, found, you find that communities would sell land and move into the forest. They would clear the forest, uh, turn it into a tea zone area, some would uh, start timber milling uh, businesses, and that forest is brutally mutilated. Now, nature is unforgiving. The, 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 the water level started rising in 2030, but last year, in the beginning of this, it's been crazy. Uh, this is a tourist attraction site, uh, so hotels have been affected, completely submerging water. Businesses have been affected, people have been displaced. We're seeing climate refugees. And this will continue unless we pause and deal with the challenge, the climate challenge. We start uh, correcting the mistakes that we're making. Um, I talk about water a lot because I worry uh, that the next crisis is going to come from water and people, people are not paying enough attention. When there is no water for drinking, when there is no water for farming, believe you me, the next thing that comes is violence, is, is, is war between communities and between countries. So this is what for me is worrying uh, and I think we are not paying enough attention to it. Tamsin, just coming to you from the, I guess, the sort of scientific perspective, a bit more of a zoomed out perspective, would you agree with that, that, that water is the, the, the key thing, that uh, the key issue in, in many places? Yeah, I have to say it's very humbling and moving to hear, you know, the lived experiences of, of people who are, who are both living and, and working in areas that are vulnerable, um, vulnerable livelihoods, vulnerable to extreme weather and changes in the as you talked about the hydrological cycle and on those those temperature difference differences i talked about they amplify the water cycle and they make the wet places of the world tend to get wetter and the dry places get drier so all of those tensions and and difficulties where people have too much rain or not enough rain become worse because it's it's sort of stretching that cycle out and so, yeah, so absolutely, that's that's one of the most important um, parts. But it's it just shows how important it is to to hear those um, those those stories of you know the rain normally ends on the Christmas day and then starts on this day and, and you know and all of these specific uh, stories, human stories of, of of what it's like to experience that change, rather than reading from a, a dry IPCC report that says you know, heavy rain extremes are, are getting more frequent and more severe over the Northern Hemisphere and droughts are getting more severe in the Mediterranean. <laughs> you know? um, Jane, I, I, I mean, I know that you have traveled the entire world and have seen much of this firsthand. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I'll just jump in briefly to say that, yes, I mm. have since 1986, I've been traveling about 300 days a year until, until the pandemic. And so I, I had the opportunity to see with my own eyes some of the effects of climate change. And as it's terribly important to educate people and to con you know counteract the climate deniers, uh, then I think if you can say as I can, I stood with Inuit elders in Greenland and heard them say, the ice here never used to melt even in summer and this was late winter, the water was pouring down and the icebergs were carving. And then to meet people who've had to leave their island homes because of sea level rise, making any storm make their, 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 their homes unsafe. And then to have seen the results of the terrible hurricanes, and the, it's the really bad hurricanes that are getting more frequent, to see the destruction and the misery. And 
see the results of the flooding that's getting worse. And these droughts that you were talking about, uh, these droughts that have led to climate refugees, the scarcity of water. I've stood with my granddaughter in Cape Town and seen where the great water reservoir was merely a patch of dried, cracked mud. I've seen cattle and wild animals dead on the Serengeti and Amara in Africa because of the droughts. And then, of course, the terrible forest fires that were raging in Australia. I saw the result of that. I watched the fires in California. So when you can tell people that you've seen it with your own eyes, it gets through to them. Like you said, it, mm. it, 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 it's more than just reading a report. It's real. It really is real indeed. It's not hopeless though. I mean, there are things that can be done. And Kira, I wonder if you could talk us a little bit through I guess things that we can potentially latch onto that might make a difference. What, what technology in particular? Are there technologies that we can, uh, you know, hope will have a role in tackling climate change? It's always great to get the job of being the cheerful one after uh, after <laughs> such a speech, speech when discussing climate change. Um, but I think that of course technology can can be a good help, and and it will be. I'm sure of that. Um, and, and we can do great things with technology and we all, we've already shown that. Um, I think it's important not to, I don't know if you discuss it in other countries as well, but at least in Denmark, and we really discuss a lot about the hockey model where we just wait a lot of years and then we do a lot because then we got technology. Uh, and I think it's important that we just don't put all of our eggs in a technology basket mm -hmm. and and believe that all will be saved when, when we only have, yeah, now it's, only nine years and one month to the 2030 goal. So uh, the time is, uh, or well, the clock is ticking. So we have to, to not just wait for technology. No, agreed. Um, yes, <laughs> difficult, yeah, I, I'm entirely right. Um, talking about those goals though, uh, the Paris Agreement of 2015, uh, this is the one obviously that uh, people talk about a lot that committed nations to, to keeping global temperature uh, to, to one and a half degree above pre-industrial levels or two degrees at most. I'm just curious, I wonder if we can go round actually um, on a scale of one to 10, shall we say, with one being no chance whatsoever and 10 being yes. Are you hopeful that this can be achieved? Maybe also briefly comment on on, uh, on your answer. Let's, let's go round. Uh, let's start with you, Tamsin, actually. Um, so I guess... I should I should say I'm in general an optimist and in general a hopeful person and and I'm going to go for the slightly easier goal of the two degrees the sticking to two degrees okay. and I would I would go with maybe around a six six and a half on that I would say better than even odds for that and I base that on on the in, on, on the plus side uh, we talk about net zero emissions by 2050 and that's for keeping temperatures to one and a half degrees but if we were trying to keep them to a, a sort of better than even chance of two degrees then we then we've got a bit more time uh, perhaps to about 2070 if we if we're lucky so but ex exactly as Kerry was saying we can't just wait until 2069 <laughs> and then cut all our emissions right so so you know, for the for the one and a half degree goal, we'd have to halve our emissions in the next ten years, roughly. Uh, but still, we'd have to to reduce them by twenty five percent in the next year, uh, ten years, to get to that goal. So that's not that's still tough, right? We're still even with COVID, mm. uh, the drop in emissions with COVID, we're still going up uh, overall. And even then, it's not a guarantee of, of staying below two degrees. So I think I think better than better than even odds for two degrees, but it's it's not easy for that either. When, when Joey, do you have uh, optimism? For this one is tough. I want to be optimistic, uh, but then the facts are stubborn. Uh, so the first question, the first reality that hits me, I would say a five, um, and this I'm really trying. Mm -hmm. But then the challenge is that 
don't see willingness and commitment from the governments, like my government. Um, then there's also the technical know-how. How do we transition? That's really lacking. And when you look around uh, the continent, for instance, there's a time I was looking for uh, the climate change act, uh, climate change um, acts. Any country that had passed an act. And my country was the only country that had passed an act, to, and it passed it in 2016. But it's, it's never been enacted. It's never been. It's not operational because um, there are still things that are pending. Africa Union that ought to be giving us guidelines. Um, their policy is still in its draft form since 2017. So I know countries were supposed to recommit last year, um, and probably they will do so this year. But then. I'm not sure we will be able to hit the mark unless we get a lot of support uh, that is from the North. Global South needs a lot of support from the North for us to achieve, if we are to achieve um, the Paris Agreement, to be honest. Kira, your thoughts? Um, yeah, well, I would probably go for three or four. Um, so that's not uh, very hopeful. Uh, I think I would say a three or four for the next five years and then I hope for technology to come and save us um, <laughs> and I think like um, it actually dropped a bit for me last week uh, I think I've been a bit more hopeful before uh, the Danish government just gave to come two and a half billion euros to to the mink farmers due to a corona outbreak uh, and in comparison uh, we gave only uh, half a billion to the climate on our financial act so for me that showed and of course that was also necessary in some sense but it showed that for a majority of politicians even in a country like Denmark the reality haven't like occurred um, so that the lack of willingness to lend the money that we need now uh, and to invest them is just missing in a way that I I don't think I really realized until uh, we've landed for, for corona recovery um, so yeah a three or four and then hoping for, for something to save us, I guess. Jane, I'm almost scared to come to you on this. I, <laughs> but what Kiel was saying there about COVID was quite interesting. Um, I know that some people have commented that uh, the way that the scientific community has come together and you know galvanized support during this crisis suggests that it is possible. Does that add any optimism to your, to your position? Well, first of all, let me say what my position is. And mm. My position is that I'm, I'm not prepared to give a number because um, mm. it really does depend on governments and governments change. And, you know, if you take, if you have countries being led by Trump's, Bolsonaro's, um, Mega um and some other governments that we can, that we can all name, then the the possibility i mean you'd be right down to one or two with some of them but they change that's the hope i mean we've just got biden in the us the first one of the first things he did was to join rejoin the paris accord and also to stop one of the big oil pipelines i forget which one and so it's it, you'd have to do it country by country by country to give any kind of realistic thing. I have hope because we don't know what's going to happen. We couldn't have predicted this pandemic, for example, and things can happen. Change can happen. Governments can be elected who are all prone, all, all dedicated to working for climate change. And I do think that this pandemic has woken people up. I do think there are more people now who realize that we actually do need a new greener economy. And, um, and I think people are beginning to be less afraid of mentioning our human population, because at the moment it's politically incorrect, but you know the facts, 7.8 billion of us on the planet now already using up natural resources in some places faster than nature can replenish them our livestock growing hugely in numbers and so so um people are really truly beginning to think we need a new greener economy and a new relationship with the natural world that's the benefit that's come out of 
the epidemic. And then we go back for hope to the young people, the young people who are not only very active when it's concerned with climate change, but also they're changing their parents. And in some cases, their parents are CEOs of big companies or high up in mm -hmm. government. And so that can push things in the right direction. That's why I'm not prepared to give a number because I don't know. Yeah. But yes, I am hopeful, mainly because of youth, because of the resilience of nature and this um, amazing intellect that's producing extraordinary technology. We, we, our brains got us into this mess. Hopefully they can get us out in time. Yeah. Hopefully, indeed. Um, you mentioning there, Jane, the fact that uh, there are some places that are doing better than others brings me, in fact, to the questions that have been sent in, um, because we have one question here from uh, Kerry in Manchester, who says, uh, do you have some examples of people or places who are doing a good job of taking positive action for the climate, uh, something that we can learn from here in the UK? Uh, Wanjohi, why, why don't we start with you on this one? Do you have any positive examples for us? And, and as Jane said, I think I want to celebrate the young people. Um, they are taking to the streets, they are putting their lives at risk, even in countries that do not even have freedom of speech. They are still calling and demanding that their governments do something to protect the environment. Uh, and I would also want to challenge the people in decision making. It's not enough that young people continue agitating on the streets. It's time that they are allowed into the decision making. Listen to them, invite them in. That way we will see transition. And I tell you, because I have been on the streets myself with a Save Our, Save Our Forest KE campaign, it was only successful because I was a member of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. And this, these are some of the big influential businesses that give government a lot of money. And they were able to put pressure on government. And unless, had I not been part of this, I don't think I would have gotten access to the leadership and also managed to put pressure on government the way I did. So there is need that they are invited. It should not be a request. It is their right that they are invited. The government and industry listens to these young people who are doing a lot of work. And there are many, as young as 13, 15, and they're already doing a lot of work um, in the conservation work. And I think I want to celebrate them. And I also want to celebrate the Global Shapers community because they are doing a lot of work um, in climate change as well. It's a community that gives me a lot of hope. In terms of young people, though, I mean, this is not always necessarily that easy uh, for young people to uh, know how to be persuasive. Um, and we had a question come in from uh, Jenny in Manchester, who said, uh, I feel like my family isn't that well informed and usually ignore talks about climate change. What would you advise me to do to try and educate them? Uh, Kira, I might come to you on this one. Yeah, I can really uh, recognize the feeling and I feel, think a lot of, uh, of young uh, climate activists and people engaging in climate activism uh, has this feeling. Um, I think it's important uh, to express what it is you're fearing. Um, so what are you afraid is going to happen if we don't solve the climate crisis? Um, I read this uh, book from a young author in Denmark on, on climate crisis as well. Uh, and she really tried to state that if we express what we're feeling and what our concerns are, it's uh, more difficult to say that you can just ignore it because you have to understand other, pe other uh, people's feelings. Um, so expressing it from your feelings and then also I mean, give yourself the space to not be able to convince everyone uh, because trying to do that can be a really, really damaging and hard job. Uh, and it's also okay to to say that that you can't uh, like overcome the whole world and explain why this is so important. A very good point. Um, Jane, I'm going to come to you on a, a, a similar question, I guess. There's um, a question from Edward in London who asks, what can a young person do to make a difference, make a big difference, other than just protest and spread awareness? Well, um, this young man, I would absolutely encourage you to find out about our Roots and Shoots program. Just because, I'm not saying that because it's my program. I'm saying it because I have had literally, I would say by now, thousands of letters from young people saying, 
when I learned about Roots and Shoots, when I joined a group of other young people who cared about things the way I did and wanted to make a difference the way I did, it changed my life. It gave me hope. I realized that all around the world, there were amazing projects conducted by incredible people. Collect them up, think about them. Don't only think about the doom and gloom. And it's when you have hope that you're prepared to take action. If you lose hope, then why bother? What's the point? If you don't think your action is going to make any difference, you might as well eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. So there's so much out there. You need to open your mind, open your eyes, read stuff, and Roots and Shoots could help you. <laughs> and Tamsin, on that theme of the, uh, the difference that we can all make, uh, we had a question from Kate also in uh, Manchester. A lot of questions from Manchester today, I've noticed, um, who asked, uh, what are the most efficient ways of reducing your carbon footprint? Do you have any advice for us? Well, sort of speaking to that question and, and the general conversation we've had, I mean, I think I think I wouldn't underestimate the the power of the the protest and the campaigning. And I say that because just this week there was a, a study out on the, the so-called Greta Thunberg effect, which showed, I think it was in the US, greater awareness of, of Greta Thunberg was correlated with greater desire to take action on climate change. And and so especially when you're a young person and, and too young to vote uh, and, and don't have so much consumer power, putting pressure on the on the big levers in society is is really what can make a difference so you can badger your supermarket you can um you know you can badger your school and and it's actually it's about the the kind of the pester power really of making your voice heard that will that will make even bigger differences than your own actions of, of reducing your waste or your electricity use or anything else. I think it's really putting pressure on the people in power that actually does make uh, the big difference. Yeah. Jane, your thoughts? Well, I think one thing that everybody can do is to move towards a plant based diet. I know that I stopped eating meat because I cared about the animals and the horrendous way they're treated in the factory farms. But now I've learned more about it, the horrible harm to the environment, the areas cleared to grow grain to feed the animals, the fossil fuel used to get the grain to the animals, to the abattoir and the meat to the table. The fact that water, precious water, so much is used to change uh, vegetable to animal protein. And then finally, one of the really savage greenhouse gases is methane. And a huge amount of the methane up there is caused by uh, animal agriculture as well. It's bad for your health, but for the environment, eating less or no meat, being vegan, plant based diet, that is something anybody can do and it really will make a difference. And if really I can just well. come back and say, we can combine those, right? We can say, well, I might personally reduce my meat, but maybe I'll go into my local, you know, restaurant and burger place and demand a vegan burger option and, you know, bug people so that there's more choice in society and structurally. I think we, I think we, we have to be aware that there are probably uh, people out there who want to blame the individual. You know, you see, uh, you see potentially big oil companies saying, what are you doing for your bit on climate change? And that's not a wrong thing to think about, but really it's about pushing the levers of the big stuff. And how can you change society, not just your own dinner plate, change everybody's dinner plates. Um, well, I just want to, uh, I, I, I'm still thinking in, in a way, Tamsin, about that point you made earlier about the Greta Thunberg effect. And, you know, uh, and in fact, actually, it ties in, uh, Wanjay, with a, a question that Anna Pittman from Northumberland has asked. Um, she says that events like this will attract people who are already interested in climate change. Uh, legislation can help to initiate change, but it's glacially slow. How can we engage with and shift the attitudes of people who don't feel that there's the need for environmental protection? Thank you, Hannah. I do a lot of work in the rural areas, um, particularly with communities living around forests. When we started the Save Our Forest K campaign, I was really, really fought, even in my own village. And they, had, they were justified to do that because we were taking away their source of livelihood without giving them an alternative. 
But then when you go down and you convene a meeting with even the timber millers and you have a conversation and you show them, uh, these are the effects. And there was a simple example. We lost somebody in 2018, a young single mother of three, to lightning. This is the first time it was happening and it was following the, the massive destruction of the forest. And so when you bring it down to their level like that, Jane made, made reference to the rains. We rely on rainfall for farming. And when that is affected and you tell them this is linked to climate change, this is the effect of climate change, it makes sense to them. So you need to come down to their level and give them examples of things that really touch on their everyday life and especially uh, their sources of livelihood and it makes sense and they are able to change. Um, I would also want to, to, to say something on carbon zero. Your contribution could be planting, nurturing and ensuring that a tree uh, grows under your name. We have a similar program in primary schools where we plant both fruit trees and indigenous trees and we tell the students that this is your tree, make sure it grows and it doesn't die. So what we're doing with the fruit trees is that we're providing food as well as greening, uh, contributing to the greening Kenya agenda. So plant and nurture the tree to maturity and you will have done uh, something really positive as well. There's something very beautiful about that idea. Kira, did you want to jump in on this question? How do you, how do you engage people who are perhaps naturally more resistant to these ideas? Yeah, I think what Jurian's uh, point is really good, uh, that it has to be something that you can feel yourself uh, and some like local uh, aspects of your life. So I think when I feel the climate changes on my everyday life, it's when I'm biking and I have a lot of pollution in my, in my, uh, in my body. Uh, so understanding that those little things are linked to the greater climate crisis, um, and showing what what it has an of an impact both on the individual but also in the society as a whole. Uh, I remember also when I first learned about the climate crisis uh, in school, it was about the ice bears uh, who was uh, soon to be distinct because of the melting uh, poles and and having those images uh, really did something for me. And I think a lot of of people in my generation uh, also when we are told that when we sprayed hairspray out in the open, it would destroy the, uh, I would say the ozone uh, layer. Mm -hmm. um, so having those everyday things linked to the climate uh, revolution, I think is important uh, as well as you said. Yeah, very much so. Um, I've just got one, one last question from uh, our audience list that we have time for. Um, it's from Libby in London, who's eight years old. And it's a question for you, Jane. Um, Libby says, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Jane Goodall a question. If you could give one bit of advice to your eight year old self, what would it be? Well, you know, people are always asking me what advice I would give myself, Libby. People are always asking me that. But you know, I was lucky, I had an amazing mother. She gave me the best advice anybody could have. And I would give that advice to you from her through me. And it would be, if there's something you really want to do, don't let anybody laugh at you. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. You'll have to work really hard. You'll have to take advantage of all opportunities. But if you don't give up, you will probably find a way to succeed. I've slightly got goosebumps now. Thank you, Jane. I think that was a great advice for everyone, no matter the age. I'm taking it and I'm 36 years old. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, thank you to the audience there for those really excellent questions. It was an incredibly interesting discussion. Um, we are coming towards the end of our evening now, but um, before we wrap up, what I'd like to do is I'd just like uh, to go around our panel and ask each speaker really um, who you would urge to change uh, in order to tackle climate change. Where do you feel like the real priorities are? Um, Kira, let's start with you. Um, well, I think that, that everyone has to do something, so both uh, individuals and corporations. Um, I think an aspect where I think is missing is the corporations. Uh, what I'm hoping for is that uh, each industry will look at themselves and assess whether their, their corporation is sustainable or not. Uh, and if it's not sustainable, then uh, remake the production and also uh, reskill the employers. Uh, and also have, and I think that's actually what I'm 
hoping for the most to have a view of how the production is also impacting the rest of the world. Uh, so if you produce meat in uh, the UK or in Denmark, you have a great impact on uh, on countries in the global south. And I think that's what I'm hoping for that they will soon realize. Tams, in your thoughts. Well, I think the key um, for me is 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 the law and and regulation. Um, so for me, governments. Um, it, it, I mean, obviously, many governments around the world are are, uh, are taking action and, and getting there and getting the, the getting with the program, as it were. Sometimes the UK government feels like it's a bit two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. I know, um, and I think. It, it's really about. I gave a talk a couple of years ago at the um, Department for International Development, and they and they sort of said, oh, "We've realised we need to put climate change at the heart of every decision that we make. You know, it needs to be the waters in which we swim." And I was just thinking as we were talking that uh, it's almost a bit like we we'd always put health and safety, you know, risk assessments of health and safety into all of our decisions and laws and design and engineering and so on. So we need to think of climate, health and safety in, in every single decision. And it needs to be part of the fabric of every of every decision and change that we make. Yeah, very good point. Jane, your thoughts? Well, my thought is always really the same, that governments and businesses, uh, every every little aspect of who we are, all of them are made up of individuals. And so when I began my chimpanzee research, I concentrated on individual behavior, which no, no ethologists had done before. In fact, I was criticized for it. We didn't talk about individuality, we talked about species. And so when you bring it, bring it down to the individual, if every single one of us, and that's including CEOs and government officials, and their children, if every one of us understood that every single day we're on this planet, we make some impact. And we have a choice as to what sort of impact we make. And if you get that philosophy running throughout life in the different categories, business, the different economic levels, the different countries, then you've got to get to the individual. How do you get to that individual to make this their philosophy through the youth? So that that philosophy ingrained into young people, taken with them into adult life, it's already changing the world. And when Johi, we'll final thoughts from you. You know, Hannah, business, the industry has really supported my work. Um, it has supported my activism, helping me put pressure on government. It supported, uh, it's now supporting my restoration work. And so I'm going to give them advice and say, uh, environmental sustainability of your business and your products and services will soon influence customer behavior. And so I say to them, do not wait until then. Uh, please change your ways as early as now. Uh, so that you're ready for when consumers will be looking at how sustainable your business is, your products are, uh, before purchasing. Uh, to civil society, I will say continue putting pressure on the streets, but let's get into decision making, let's review policy, existing policy, and let us help formulate uh, new policies as well. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of you. I think. Uh, uh, Everyone watching will agree with me that we have had an incredible discussion this evening, a very inspiring and impressive panel. So uh, thank you very much to all of our guests there, Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, Wanjo Hejiroji, Dr. Tamsin Edwards and Kira Peter Hansen, MEP. Thank you so much for all of you. And uh, thank you to all of you at home as well for joining us tonight. Now, if tonight inspired you, then please don't forget that uh, the next in our series of Climate Talks is in just a few weeks time on Saturday the 13th of February, when Helen Chersky will chair a discussion exploring the great scientist Dr. James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. Uh, the guests on that evening will be Gaia Vince, uh, Zamzam Ibrahim and Professor Chris uh, Rapley. And this is part of the online Manchester Science Festival. You can book your free ticket 
uh, and you can find out about the rest of the Climate Talk series uh, by clicking a link uh, below. And if you would like to support the Science Museum Group's mission to inspire the next generation, uh, you can also find a link below to make a, a donation. So that brings us uh, to the end of the opening night of Climate Talks. So please do take care, uh, stay safe, and a very good evening to all of you.